Sunday night edition of the Anaheim Calling Podcast. We are here to discuss a 3-2 Ducks victory over the Florida Panthers at Honda Center. St. Patrick's Day edition of the Anaheim Calling Podcast, I should mention. For those who are watching live and for those who are listening to the recorded version, I will make a note. Jake and I are both rocking the green tonight, so... No pinches. No coming our pinching. Way. No pinching, people. No we're, pinching we're respect- coming our way. We're respecting now, the great holiday that is St. Patrick's may, Day. Now you may have to pinch me a little because Devin Shore once again picking up a gold tonight. Um, there was a lot of, I would say Jack, that Jacob although- Jacob Silverberg also, you know that job security. <laughs> you know, I I would say that there there's a lot of things that you can maybe nitpick about this Ducks win, but at the end of the day. I do think that this was a good win for the Ducks. They, yes, they got outshot. Yes, uh, John Gibson had to make a lot of saves. I think a lot of it was because of the Panthers having to come back late in this game. I think that overall, this was a this was a pretty good effort from the Ducks. And if you look at some of the stats, especially in that third period, they got outshot, outchanced. But that's kind of to be expected when a team is trying to come back in the third period. The Florida Panthers, who are out of the playoff picture. And so the Ducks not really doing them any favors tonight. Now, before we get into tonight's game, um, not really, I mean, not really any big news to mention. Brendan Gooley still uh, on the shelf. Sounds like he'll be coming back soon. Maybe, maybe. Also, maybe, maybe, also maybe not. Here's a question that comes in the Twitch chat from Diehard24 Fan24 said, How were the hangovers? They were bad. It was it was not a good day yesterday morning for me. By by noon I, I was fine. By like okay, not even noon. By like three I was fine. Yeah, it was good at like eight PM, something like that. And uh, we're we're back going. Both of us have beer right now. Yep. But I did want to mention this to our listeners because believe me, we we don't have a show with that listeners. That's just how <laughs> that's just how the game works. And, you know, the drunk pod is something that we do every once in a while during the season to keep things light. We've only done, I believe, three. Yep. Three of them all all year. And if you have any reservations about them or you think maybe they're a little too much or maybe you love them, whatever the case may be, please let us know, because obviously it's it's a it's a pod that I think maybe has more value for the live listeners. I don't know. The thing is, I just don't know. So go out and let us know either through an Apple podcast review or just hitting us up on Twitter. I'm at Felix underscore Sicard. Jake is at Reindeer Games 91. Let us know. We should put out a Twitter poll if people are pro or anti drunk pod. Because we had mixed reviews a little bit. We had some people saying that they loved it. We had some people saying that they did not love it. <laughs> and so we, we got to make sure that we're doing the right thing because at the end of the day, you, you guys are the ones driving this bus, so we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing here by you. Um, but although, it was a lot of fun, though, although and Saturday was a rough one. <laughs> we, we, should, we should preface this, that no matter what, though, next Saturday is going to be a little bit of a tipsy podcast because that is going to be a post-Patreon watch party show. Yes. All of us probably in the same room after having drinks with all of our patrons, so... Expect some shenanigans. So but I'm that, giving, that, that I'm, giving a a I'm giving because a forewarning. I'm giving a forewarning. It's going to be a live pod, and as as an avid podcast listener myself, I I can attest to this that I enjoy listening to a live podcast more than someone that's doing it over recording that type of thing. Well, or, there's going to be Skype. a recorded version of that. Or no, sorry, I mean over uh, over Skype because you can tell when someone's in the same room or not. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Right, but. All of that being said, we do have a game to talk about. I should mention, George is in our Twitch chat. I went to a stick time with him yesterday. He wants me to mention how stick time was with him. I taught him how to maybe kind of sort of stop. And also had a beer <laughs> league game today. And you know, even though we picked up the loss, goal and an assist for this guy. So, you know, who so cares about care the team? You, so you care more about your own stats than Who, who cares the about team? the loss when you know you got that goal and that apple? You know, two-point night. Probably could have yeah. had more. Was dangling. Hit a post, you know? <laughs> Jake just showing his true colors right now. Well, let's get into tonight's game because I thought that it was a good one. Again, maybe not the most savory for the analytically inclined, but it was a, it was a fun game to watch nevertheless. 
Um, very early in the first period, Ryan Getzlaff does his patented little shot fake and then kind of walks it in from the point, gets it on net, and Montambo gives up a rebound that comes out to Devin Shore, and he's able to rifle it home. That would make it 1-0 Anaheim very early in this game. But Yevgeny Dadanov, very early in the second period, before our own C.J. Woodling had even time to get back to his seat, uh, gets the Panthers on the board, makes it 1-1. to uh, Basically, the uh, Panthers just getting behind the Ducks' defense very early on, and their center not being able to get back on that play. First period was tightly contested, but... Obviously, early in that first, or sorry, early in that second, the the Panthers striking early. Now, yeah. later in the second Wait. period, around the eight minute mark. Re- oh, real, go ahead. Real quick, I want to make mention um, with Devin yes. Shore. One of the things that I mentioned when the Ducks got Devin yes. Shore, as, as much as I've been on the anti Devin Shore train, and he's starting to make me eat crow a bit on it, which rightfully so, I'm not too mad about that. But one of the things that I thought that they could do well with him was, um was basically putting him on the power play because if you look at um, what he did in Dallas, where he provided a positive impact on the team was actually on the power play, especially in the net front area and providing in the slot, net front area, that type of thing. And on this goal, we saw that. Granted, it's a puck luck goal. It's 100% a puck luck goal. You look at right. you look at it, the shot goes off Nick Ritchie, bounces right to Devin Shore, but he's in a good spot in good space and ends up putting the puck right on net. So that is something that I looked at when the Ducks got him as something that they could utilize him in and provide some positive impact on this team. And it's nice to see that they're starting to do that because I don't think he was really used on the power play until recently. A Partially, I think, right. due to the fact that Ryan Kessler was getting second power play minutes. And so once uh, once Kessler's gone out, they kind of needed to fill that hole with someone who can take some faceoffs. And so they're putting Devin Shore out there. And he's out there and gets lofts on the point. And so it gives him two center options. Um, and I think it's providing some good value. Yes. And this is something that we've been talking about now for a few games is that Devin Shore has looked pretty good. I think that he is flashing some parts of his of his game that maybe we didn't anticipate before he was traded over from Dallas, you know, the skill level and some of the skating. And now just as a little recap, you know, since coming over, he has 10 points in 26 games, which isn't really anything home to necessarily write about, but that's about 35 to 40 points over yeah. a full season. If he's if he's your third line center moving forward, that's not terrible. If he's your fourth line center, which potentially could be the case, Right. That's even better. Right. And by the by the time next season rolls around, he'll be 25. So there's still a little room to grow. I think that he's a guy who can help this team moving forward. And that trade is starting to look a little better. Now, I should mention this goal because it was a really nice one. Uh, the Ducks defending in their own zone. Ryan Getzlaff picks up a puck. He's able to do a really nice bank pass to Adam Henrique, who kind of recognizes what Getzlaff is trying to do, immediately gets on his horse, tracks down this uh, lead pass from Getzlaff, skates it all the way down. And this is a really nice play because call it hockey smarts, call it just reading the reading and reacting, whatever you want to call it. This is a really nice play from Adam Henrique. Yeah. He, as soon as he gets the puck, he sees Aaron Eckblad over committing to one side. And instead of just getting the shot off right away, he recognizes that, uh, Ekblad's momentum is going one way, puts on the heel drag. This is not a toe drag, folks. A lot of people call it a toe drag. I believe that even my own tweet during the game, I called it a toe drag. The, the broadcast he's, the broadcast crew called it a toe drag also. He's dragging with his heel, not his toe. I'm just sorry. That's how it works. But anyway, so he drags it across and is able to get right past Ekblad, working his own momentum against him. And then from there, gets a shot off, goes high glove side, on Montembeau, and that makes it 2-1 Anaheim. That was just a really nice executed play, I gotta say. Yeah, it really, really was. And we saw the skill level that Henrik has. I know that we we kind of rail on him a bit with different things here and there because, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't think he's going to be worth that contract. But you look at the skill level that he has on this play, and that's a high level skill or high skill level play right there that you got to have confidence to be able to pull off. And it was the right move and right play. Um, the only thing that I'm mad about is that he had Corey Perry wide open to put it in the net and decided <laughs> to be selfish and score the goal and deprive me of a hashtag Perry is still good goal. 
Right. And by the way, I should mention that Corey Perry was struck uh, by the Jacob Larson one timer. I believe that was in the second period. And so I'm not sure. I'm going to look it up right now. By the way, Spencer Woods 137 in our Twitch chat says, "Is Felix con- uh, content or complimenting Henrique? Is he taking shots again?" <laughs> well, look, I'm just saying uh, that Cor- you know that Henrique tonight, uh, specifically on that play, made a really good decision. So whether that means that I'm I've been drinking, whatever you want to make of it, I, I think that it is worth mentioning that he made a really nice play in that moment. Now, another thing I do want to mention here. So, yes, Perry did not return um, after that play. And so that's <laughs> – we'll see what happens there. I th- Actually, I think he may have came back later in the game. But the point being, it was a, it was a scary moment because Larson – the Ducks were actually having a really good shift, and Larson just hammers it on net. And it hit Perry right in kind of between the chest – and the hips. So that's not Lewis. Lewis in our Twitch chat said he was back in the third infinite gesture. Right. Also saying that. Right. Exactly. So he was back in the third, but it was, it was a scary moment nevertheless, because you could see it in the slow motion replay. As soon as he went, as he was hit, he just kind of, his head snapped back and you could see the, the obvious pain. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, I, I know that feeling, you know, took a puck in the cage tonight, ended up hitting my <laughs> collarbone. You got to power through it sometimes. It's, it, it's all about Jake's beer league, basically. That, that, that's what it all beer, comes Beer about. league life, beer league life. Early in the third period, Jonathan Huberdeau makes a really nice play through the neutral zone. Ricard Raquel overcommits, and he's able to sneak by him. And then at that point, uh, I mean, slight interference by Aaron Eckblad because he kind of bumps Josh Manson on his way to the net. Josh Manson doesn't realize that Aaron Eckblad has snuck behind him. Huberdeau is able to make a really nice pass through both Lindholm and Manson, Ekblad is left all alone in front. He taps it home. That would make it a 2-2 hockey game. So at that point, you know, the, the Panthers were buzzing, getting a lot of pucks on net. Yeah. Seemed like it could be going and, in the Panthers' favor. And that was a really nice pass by Huberto right there. It, it was. That, 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 that's a tough pass to pull that, off. That's a very tough pass, and it basically left it where Aaron Ekblad did not have to do a whole lot to score a goal. Um, it was basically just put a stick there and let the puck deflect off it. I do want to make mention of a little bit, th- a little bit of thing with the Panthers. Their top line is insanely good. The well, the, the Huberto <laughs> Barkov and tonight it was Dadenov. They've had Vetrano on that line. They've had Hoffman up there. They have issues with that team, but that line is just you put Barkov and Huberto together, and those two are very, 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 very good. Um, I mean, yeah, they Huberto, almost Barkov Dadenov. I almost took down a GPP slate this uh, season, a big one with that line. So I know how much they can go off at different points in time. So they're very, very good. I mean, it it, it really is striking to me that they are not in the playoff picture this season. Um, You know, given the talent they have on their team, I think that them like Buffalo are one of those are, are, are among that group of teams in the Eastern conference that will be in the playoffs next season by virtue of, you know, their best players still being on the upswing of their careers and other teams in front of them maybe being on the downswing a little bit. That yeah, being said, they, 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 they need to get a, uh, uh, a starting goalie in there though. Well, I mean, Roberto Longo has missed a lot of the season. It's James Reimer to, has also. Yeah. It's starting to look doubtful that he'll be back next year, which makes me sad because I love Roberto Longo, but does Sergei Bobrovsky end up in Florida? Well, that's the thing is that Panarin and Bobrovsky are rumored to be in uh, the in the sight lines for Florida. But let's not make this a Panthers podcast. Late in the third period, Ducks are controlling in the Panthers zone, and none other than Jakob Silverberg once again showing that since the extension, he's just been. I mean. It, it, it almost feels repetitive at this point to say this, but Jakob Silverberg has been damn good since getting that extension from Bob Murray. Yeah. I mean, he's been really, really good. I don't know how many goals he's had, but I mean, this is what happens with goal scorers. And right. I, it, it, when I was so adamant about trading, it was never because of the player. It was because of the contract. And I still have some issues with that, but if they can work their way around it this summer, that contract can provide good value. At the end of the day, goal scoring in the NHL is hard, and it's very, very, very streaky. 
Right. You have guys right. that will consistently, consistently score over a 10 game stretch and then go cold for 20 games after that. And that's what we're seeing right now from Jacob Silverberg. And he's right. probably going to stay on this pace for the best year. He's probably going to break, break 25 goals. I mean, it, it, it's how shooting percentage works. You look at Matt Bolesky when he scored 25 goals and it was just, he was on a hot streak. It wasn't that he was a good goal. Right, but really, Silverberg is so, a no, much no, no. better player. And, and yes. Silverberg has consistently done that over the years. But when shooting runs hot, the puck finds right. the back of the net and consistently does that. Bolesky was kind of an extreme example of that. But uh, we're starting to see it now from Silverberg with the puck going in the net. And, I mean, maybe it's job security. Maybe it's just the fact that he was due after creating right. a lot of shots and a lot of chances. And you looked at his numbers around the time of signing the contract, and he had some of the best numbers on the entire team instead of in terms of generating his own shots, generating his own chances, generating his own um, high danger chances, expected goals. Basically, anything you looked at, he was around the top on the team in terms of creating all that. And eventually, when you put that many on net, some of them are going to go in. I was listening to um, 31 Thoughts, the podcast. And they referenced Jeff Merrick having having an interaction with Brendan Shanahan. Jeff Merrick called BS on this interaction. Uh, yeah, did you I hear this? That. And, I, yeah, that, and, that was great. And didn't believe it, but essentially Brendan Shanahan said he's like, "I'm a career twelve and a half percent shooter. I had five shots in this game. If I get five shots on goal in the next game, then some of them are gonna go, or one's gonna find the back of the net based upon my shooting percentage." Jeff Merrick called BS on him actually <laughs> thinking that, but. As someone in management, that actually is a good way to think about it. Right, right. Now that, that was pretty great. But just to describe Silverberg's goal here, that would actually win the game for Anaheim. It was Ryan Getzlaf uh, winning a puck battle down low, or sorry, uh, Ricardo Kell winning a, a puck battle down low, spins off of his defender, gets it up to Silverberg in front, who mysteriously was left wide open. I'm not sure how that happened. Uh, but he goes immediately to his backhand. And goes far side, puts it in the back of the net, and that would make it three to two Anaheim, which would end up being the final score. So game winning goal for Silverberg, who now has twenty two goals on the season. And I should make a note of this: that is his second highest goal total of his career. And there are eight games left for the Ducks this season. He has a chance to set a career high in goals. By the way, he's only played sixty five games this season, so. Had he played 80, all eighty-two games? Well, so how many I mean, points? How many points does he got right now? He would be at thirty-four, thirty-four points in the season. Yeah. So, and that's a pretty good pace. He what? He's on pace for 40, 45 points. Yeah. I mean, right, right now, if you just looked at his pace, he has thirty-four points in sixty-four games, or sorry, sixty-five games. And so, realistically, forty point there, range. There, there's eight. There's eight games left. I would say he's probably going to finish with 37 points. Yeah, 30, but if, if points. when I say range, I mean if he played all all 82 games, he's on pace for 40 40 to 50 points in right. that range, which is not too bad if you're you're looking at the production you're getting at 5, what is it? 5.25? Right. Well, so if you okay, so if you times his production this season by the by 82, he's at about 43 points on the year. Yeah. Which is right in range with his career average. You know, he's a forty-point guy. Yeah, he could hit a high in terms of goals. Uh, but this season is—that's the thing with Jakob Silverberg, and that's what I think got him the extension is that he is such a consistent contributor to this team. You yeah. pretty much always know what you're going to get from him. The goal scoring it may wax, it may wane, but at the end of the day, you know what you're getting from this guy. And uh, I think that you know if what we believe is true that the Ducks are going to be back competing next season, then he's a pretty big asset for this team right now. Yeah. I mean, he definitely is. And that's, I mean, people may call me, uh, may say I'm backtracking a bit with how hard I was uh, on the, the tail or on the, the wagon of trading him. But right. like I said, the reasons for trading him were never the fact of he's a bad player. It's never the fact of he, I mean, I still think that, that contract I'm not a huge fan of because of the years, but it's right. never because he wasn't worth that contract. 5.25 is exactly what he's worth. It's actually probably a little less than what he's worth on the open market, if you're being honest, in terms right. of what 5.25 million is supposed to get you on the open market um, in terms of production. He over, he probably outproduces that. Um, whether or not he's going to be able to keep up this production into his early 30s, that's up in the air and we'll have to see. 
But well, I mean, but but I mean, statistically, we probably know it's not going to happen. But I think he can still be a good contributor, yes. especially if you assume that some of the young guys are going to get bigger roles yes. as that time comes along. Yep, exactly. And so I think we're seeing what he can do in the positive light right now. And it's not me backtracking, but it's me kind of assessing what he can bring in the future. Because at the end of the day, he's under contract now. That's not going to change. So you got to move forward right. and assess what the situation is. And he's a player that is producing well and pl- has been playing well for the Ducks and could provide a positive impact moving forward if he keeps playing like this. Right. Some other takeaways from the night. I thought that John Gibson was very, very good. I mean, he made a couple of really just outstanding saves, notably on Yevgeny Dadanov from in tight, um, really just slamming the door shut. Uh, the, the Panthers scored two goals tonight. Their expected goals was 2.87. So basically, I mean, this is rounding up a little bit, but John Gibson was basically one goal better than what you would have expected an average goalie to let in. Uh, From a skater perspective, I thought that Troy Terry was pretty good. I thought that Max Jones was probably the best young forward tonight, young player. I mean, he he had a couple of moments where, I, I believe one in the first period, where just battling through traffic and somehow turned almost turned just a puck battle into a breakaway. I mean, he, his stick handling is so good in restricted areas and tight spaces. I thought that Max Jones was very good tonight. I thought that Troy, Troy Terry had moments as well. I thought that overall those two were very good. One player that I'm not concerned about, but that the, the trend is a little concerning Cam Fowler and Jacob Larson that were not good at all together tonight. I mean, they were the worst ducks pairing uh, by expected goals for percentage. And if you look at the stats so far this season, um, Cam Fowler with Jacob Larson have a 45.3 Corsi 4 percentage. Um, so they're not really controlling the shot attempt battle when they're out there. And then if you look at it uh, from a scoring chance for percentage, uh, those two, when they're on the ice, 47.2 scoring chance for percentage. So they're, they're just not really controlling play when they're out there which is basically the complete opposite of Brendan Gooley and Cam Fowler. And so they're both small samples, but the, the, the sample with Gooley is just so much better. And so we're just going to have to see how it progresses. I would expect um, that when Gooley is back and ready to play, which it sounds like that time is coming soon, yeah, uh, that they will be back together because that pairing just doesn't seem to be working to me. Yep. I um, want to run through a couple things on the screen right now is the game flow chart. Um, the solid kind of darker line is score and venue adjusted. So if you look at score and venue adjusted, it doesn't really make a huge difference in this game. The Panthers were still pushing and just because they were behind it, they were still getting a lot of the shots. You look at the heat map, this, the, the Panthers had a lot of shots in front of the net. A lot of them from kind of the high slot area right above the circles. The Ducks had a fair amount of shots right in front of the net, which is what they did well. Um, I do want to also highlight, so that's from Natural Stat Trick, and then moving over to Money Puck, expected goals, when you get a 5-on-5, Flurry flurry score and venue adjusted, Flurry flurry kind of takes into consideration rebounds and different things like that, but you end up with 2.47 for the Panthers, 1.84 for the Ducks, so, and if you look at chances, a lot of the Panthers' chances are right in front of the net, so I think overall this night kind of felt like, it almost felt like a throwback to the beginning part of the season. Where the Ducks got outshot, outchanced, um, and really had to rely on John Gibson and had a little bit of the percentages in their favor. Um, it's not exactly what I want to see from them moving forward um, in terms of if I'm looking for play styles for next season. Um, but, I mean, they got the win. I everyone, mean, it, ev- everyone, it's going to happen. It, it, yeah. It, it's going to happen. John Gibson in net. And so, but as someone who is still definitely, and this is not going to change for the rest of the year on team tank. Um, I'd rather them lose this game. I'd rather, right. them, I'd rather them play well and lose that. That's basically what I want from this team for the rest of the season. I actually have an article coming out this upcoming week and hopefully actually tomorrow. That's going to break down kind of all the different percentages, everything like that, everything about pretty much why they should not be winning games right now. Right. Well, if you look, you know, territorially, I think that the Panthers were the better team. But from a shot quality standpoint, the game was a lot closer than maybe the raw yeah. totals would indicate. I thought that the Ducks played a pretty good game. I thought that 
I mean, as weird as it sounds, sometimes you sometimes getting bailed out by John Gibson is just kind of a product of your roster. John Gibson is just very good. And so this is what's going to happen. It's not something you want to build around long term. But I thought that for tonight, it worked out for them. Um, Lindholm and Banson were both very good together overall. Um, I thought that there were good moments from different pockets of the roster. I still think that this is a, a positive game. You know, if you're if you're projecting out next season. Now, as far as the draft lottery is concerned, that's a different story. Yeah. Um, this game was probably not a positive, but hey, we're not. You know, I, I, at this point, we we already knew the Ducks were probably not going to get into the top three. And so now the question is just let's see how they look going into next season. Um, any other thoughts you have on tonight's game before we get into some questions here? Uh, I do want to make mention. So there was an article that came out today, and this popped in my head when you were talking about Troy Terry, um, about Troy Terry, and especially it kind of highlighted his trip and first game back in um, back in Colorado. And there were some interesting quotes that I think that are, are relevant and worth bringing up with uh, with Troy Terry. Um, specifically ones from uh, Corey Perry and Ryan Getzloff. Corey Perry, uh, this is specifically in related to the game in Colorado, said, I thought he played pretty well. He made some good plays. It's exciting for him coming home. What did they say? He had 250 or 300 uh, people here. That's a big crowd. We found a way to put on a win and a good show for him. And then this more so jumps into his actual play style from Ryan Getzloff. This said he's, uh, Getzloff said he's developing more of the confidence with the puck, uh, learning what abilities uh, what the abilities are at this level compared to the minor league level, what he can and can't do at certain times. He's being really smart with his decision, decision making in that aspect. He's definitely more confident. Uh, that comes with time, obviously playing in the minors and stuff, getting his confidence back, playing against men. And it showed when he came up for sure. And then there was also a quote, uh, from Mark Morris, an assistant coach, ba- basically saying, we're seeing more and more of that of him basically making seam passes and different things like that. And, said uh, he's special. That's coming from Morrison. And Henrique said he has a really high skill level. So there you go. There you go. That confirms that Troy Terry is a future all-star. Yep. Yep. <laughs> you know. <laughs> All right. Do I think we have a couple questions from Twitter, actually. Yes. So let's start with those because we're going to have some questions coming in on the Twitch chat. If you do have the Twitch, uh, if you are in the Twitch chat right now, or if you're listening to a recorded version of this, we do a live stream each and every episode at twitch.tv slash Anaheim calling SBN. You can interact with us live, uh, discuss in the Twitch chat with other people. Um, it's a really good time. And with Twitch, you can actually have a free a subscription that helps out the show if you have Amazon Prime. If you have Amazon Prime, you have Twitch Prime. All you have to do is link your account, uh, your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account and then hit that subscribe button over there above Felix's head is where that subscribe button is. Um, and with that, you get a special emote next to your name. You get or a special badge next to your name and special emotes in the chat. And the emotes right now, and I'm going to add another one soon, potentially taking out a different one. But right now, the emotes are... Elmo with a Team USA national team development program on with flames around him and then a picture of Jack Hughes. So enjoy those for now. Throw them in the Twitch chat if you are in the Twitch chat right now. And then we will start to get to some questions. But let's hit these first. Duncan, uh, who said, Ginge Gantor. Uh, He told me that's how his Twitter handle is pronounced, so I'm happy he can finally do that. But said, are the Anaheim Ducks in a similar situation to the Arizona Coyotes uh, where last year seems like a lot of similarities can be drawn? Bad teams starting to play well. This year, they're in the playoff hunt. What do you think? Um, not really. I think that the, the Arizona Coyotes are a lot different than the Ducks in terms of how their roster is laid out. I think that with the Coyotes, you know, Clayton Keller is an obvious blue chip prospect that they're building around. I think that going into this year, the added guys that they well, could kind of but help I, supplement that. I, I think there are some similarities, though, that you can draw between the two teams. Like what? That they have young guys? I, I think the and, similarities are you have two teams building towards the future. Maybe the Coyotes were... I mean, yeah. Like, like, like nominally, they're both building towards the future. I guess, I guess you could say that. Um, but I don't think that that makes them really similar teams in how they're doing it. I think that like the, the the Coyotes have been rebuilding for a number of years now. The Ducks are are new to that game as of this year. Last year, the Ducks were making the playoffs. They did get annihilated in the first round. 
the Coyotes missed the playoffs because they had injuries early in, in the beginning of the last season, and you know they just couldn't rally in time. I don't really put these two teams in the same category just because I think that the Ducks have high-paid veterans that are still going to be good next year, and they have a lot of young pieces surrounding those guys. The Coyotes are really exclusively a young club. I mean, they don't really have, you know, even their veterans are young veterans. You know, Oliver Ekman Larson, Jason Demers, you know, up front, they don't really have any veterans. Michael Gravner, I guess, is a veteran. Uh, but to me, these these are these are very different clubs in, in how they've been constructed. Maybe their arc as of right now is similar, but I don't I, I think that if the idea is, OK, the, if the similarity that you're trying to draw is they miss the playoffs one year and then the next year they're back in the hunt, then, yes, the Ducks and the Coyotes are similar because the, the Ducks are going to miss this year. But next year, they're probably going to be back in the hunt. Yes. In that respect. I think that they are similar, but outside of that, I think that they are very, very different franchises, very different organizations, and very different rosters overall. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that you can draw some similarities, especially with the Arizona blue line kind of being set. They're not rebuilding so much there. It's kind of set moving forward. They do have some veterans on that team with Derek Stepan, with like you said, Michael Grabner, but I think that they are in a little bit of a different situation with their forward group um, by not having kind of that Getzloff type figure or something like that. Um, but I think that you can draw some similarities, but I think they are in different situations. I think you also look at it where last year they had the same coach as they do now. Um, they still had Rick Tockett behind the bench, so they're building, having the same mentality, same message getting put across, and whereas the Ducks, it's going to be a completely new right. message over summer. And I think that's my biggest thing with saying that it's not a completely apples to apples scenario because of the coaching staff. Um, right. And, and Rick Tockett is maybe their version of the Dallas Akins, as we will find out. Mm -hmm. here. Yep. Um, so let's hit this question also from Willa 13 said, is the NHL prepared for when the inevitable happens and the Edmonton Oilers win the draft lottery? <laughs> oh, that's a question that we're all wondering here. I too am wondering if that will happen. I don't Please see no. it happening, Please no. but Please no. crazier things have happened. Um, <laughs> like Edmonton I mean, getting three straight number one overall picks. <laughs> I mean, it's possible. It's very possible. Uh, the Oilers were also terrible during that time. And back then, if you finished last, you had higher odds than you do now. Um, all that being said, I don't see the Oilers winning it this year. I don't think they were bad enough. And with the way that the odds are now set up, it seems exceedingly unlikely, but it is not impossible. And so let's just let's just mentally get ourselves ready for the Oilers getting Jack Hughes. Yeah. All right. So let's jump into some questions from the Twitch chat. So D Frenzy said, how far do you think we will drop in the lottery given our recent good play? Give me a prediction for where the Ducks are going to end up. So I'll, I'll lay out the standings for you real quick. The Ducks are currently fifth from last, and so they have 69 points in 74 games. Then you've got the Rangers right behind or right above them with 69 points in 72 games. So two games in hand. You got Vancouver with 70 uh, points in 72 games. You've got <laughs> Buffalo with 71 points in 72 games. Edmonton with 71 points in 72 games. Then Colorado with 74 points in 72 games. Uh, Chicago, uh, that's weird that they're listed below them, but Colorado's at, uh, or Chicago's at 73 points in 71 games. Um, where do you think they end up? Give me your prediction. Do, do, do you want a specific? Give me a, give me a specific spot. I think they're going to finish fifth. I think they're going to get the fifth overall pick. They're going to get the fifth overall pick. I think Colorado is going to, I think LA is going to be in there. I think that Detroit's going to be in there. I, I, I just see the Ducks finishing outside of that, but it is also very possible that the Ducks end up in the top three. So I don't know. But if I, if you were to put a gun to my head, I'm going to say fifth. That feels like the most likely answer. By the way, Adam wanted me to repeat. Uh, Adam Hutchinson, staff writer in our Twitch chat, said wanted me to repeat. Uh, the Ducks have 69 points in 74 games. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yes. Nice. Um. So what was your prediction? Sorry, I was very much Fifth. set on that. What's yours? Thing. Fifth. Also, I should mention that New Jersey well, is behind yours? the Ducks. What's yours? What's Fifth. yours? Hold on. Fifth. You're going fifth. Yeah. I, I You're think... not going to predict. You know, this is a reverse jinx thing. Possibly. I mean, New Jersey is what? Six points behind the Ducks, but have a game in hand? 
Yeah, I mean, the Ducks are winning too many games now to get back into that top three. Although, I still think L.A. is within reach because of those two games. Although, it's 11 points right now, so who knows? I I think the Ducks are just they're winning too many games. Three games in hand. Three games in hand. It's just unbelievable that Colorado is going to get a top two pick. They may get both. They may get both. It's it's so dumb. They may get both. I mean, let's be real. They're going to get the second and the seventh pick. Yeah, possibly. We'll see. Um, so I have up on uh, I have Tankathon up just so people can see kind of the update or current standings and how it affects the draft. So lockdown late night said with Soberberg uh, getting signed to the contract he did. How do you think feel this will affect uh, keeping Henrique? I feel like he's gone at the uh, either this off season or by the expansion draft. Yeah, I, I think that with Adam Henrique, it's not so much... He, I question. think you meant draft lottery, actually, in April. Right. I mean, it's not so much a question of the value, of, you know, how good he is of a player, right, that type of thing. I think it's just more of the fact that the Ducks have other weaknesses. I think that he is not... You know, I mean, I, I think that he's probably not good enough to be a second-line center. And as a third-line guy, he's great if you're already a good team. And so he's just kind of that tweener. And I think right now the Ducks need clear-cut guys. And so I think the part of their priority is to hopefully make Getzlaff, you know, a little lower down the pecking order. Because right now they're relying so much on him. Let's see what they can do getting him down to that second-line role. I think that the Ducks really need to figure out their center depth. I think that they're probably going to trade Henrik, A, for the cap considerations. I think he makes a lot of money. That contract is going to be difficult moving forward and also to try to liven up uh, what they have down the middle and maybe across the, the roster. We'll see. Yeah. But I do think that he is the guy that gets traded this offseason. I think that he – well, let's let's put it this way. I think he's the guy most likely to get traded this yep. offseason. Yep, and actually I'm also writing a second article to hopefully come out this week, maybe next Wow, Jake next is summer. just cranking out the content. Uh, looking at the roster for next season, what I think is going to happen, looking at Cap. From? I don't know. I was motivated today. I wrote an article and a half. So that article is half written. So I still have to keep wow. going on it. Jake is crushing This may die, day. and I may come to regret mentioning it on here because it may not ever come out. We'll see. Who knows? The idea needs to be flushed out a little <laughs> now bit Now you better. have to. Now you have to. It needs to, to be flushed out a little bit better. Um, uh, Zena's 8 uh, asked was, or basically was uh, mentioning what Bonnie had said earlier that I guess all of the Kessler stuff in the team store was on sale today. No. Yeah. No. Well, well, what was the discount? Bonnie, throw in the Twitch chat what the discount was, please. Let was it thirty percent off? Forty percent off? I do not because because if it's that high, then we need to start. We need to start talking. I think I saw that like it, like shirts were all like five to ten dollars. Uh, yeah, five or ten dollar shirts, Kessler jerseys. Oh man, Kessler stuff I mean, was either. I don't think it was jerseys, but it was. Uh, five dollars or ten dollars. Uh, five dollars shirts. Five dollars shirts. Ten dollars sweatshirts. That's a big discount. Th- yeah, because usually a, a you know a jersey as they call it, a, a t-shirt with the the player's name and number on the back, that's usually about twenty five thirty bucks. Yeah, that's so a big if it's discount on sale for thir- five, five bucks. Not jerseys from Bonnie. Oh man. I mean, Jake and I talked about it on Friday. It may have gotten a little lost <laughs> in the debauchery, but I mean, I, it seems very unlikely that he is back in any capacity. Yeah. So it doesn't mean that he's retiring, folks. It just it could just mean, well, it could mean a number of things. But at the end of the day, what it boils down to is that he's probably not going to be back next season. Yeah. Um... So we'll see. We'll see. Diehard uh, 24 fan 24 said, just bought a blank 25th anniversary jersey tonight at the game. Uh, wanted, want to, he wants to get Max Jones on it, but should he get number 49 on it or wait to see if he changes his number? No, What's no, your opinion? Get for, get for, no, no. I, I think I, I, think I oh. told this to I told this to Bonnie a couple weeks ago when I was at the Habs game, but get 49 because then when inevitably Max Jones changes his number, then you can say, I have a Max Jones it, 49 number. It, so I disagree. Jersey. I disagree. It, it's like I disagree. It's like, if you're, it's like if you're a Lakers fan who has a Kobe number eight jersey. It's I, the I, same thing. I disagree wholeheartedly. 
not on down. not on this that's specific down. one. I want the jersey number that that player is going to be associated with. But no, in, no, no, no. Wait, no, but, no, but wait, but wait. But if you have forty nine, it shows you've been there since the beginning. But uh, hear me out on this. I'm going to counter. It's not his I, junior number, Bonnie. It's what he's wearing right now as I'm, a member of the Anaheim Ducks. I'm going to ca- National Hockey. I, I'm going to I'm going to counter what I just said though. It's the th- it's the twenty fifth anniversary jersey. As a jersey, as a as a as a uh, snob about jersey numbers, and jerseys in general, Max Jones will not have worn that jersey with a different number. He will have only worn number forty nine in that jersey because that is a one off jersey. So get number forty nine on that jersey because that is the number Max Jones wore in that jersey. Yes, it's a it's a it's a point in time. The fact that he has the forty nine now with a jersey that was like I mean think about it. He's probably going to change from 49. He's Oh wait, he's not wearing 40, he's not wearing 49. Max Jones? Isn't he wearing 46? Jake, I really want you to google this right now <laughs> while I go on and actually talk to the people. Um so he's wearing 49 right now with a jersey that's never going to be worn again. You have a once in a lifetime opportunity to wear the ultimate he's wearing, jersey. He, he's he's number 46. Right now? I think so. You're wrong. Jake, you're wrong. I'm sorry. You didn't watch the game tonight. You're wrong. Oh, no. He's 49. You're right. Adam Hutchinson uh, chimes in that he, uh, Street War 46. God, you're just so wrong. Anyway, so the point being, as a fan <laughs> of the Anaheim Ducks this season, you have a chance to not only buy a jersey that's Whoops. never going to be worn again, but also a number that will potentially be changed for a player who will potentially be a huge part of this franchise moving forward. To me, this is the ultimate buy low high reward purchase for a jersey highly recommend getting that done do it you won't regret it i say get get for 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 those who bought a 71 montour jersey don't let that scare you off i think this one has a better chance of sticking well also players in the 40s uh typically kind of stay with that number you look at hampus lindholm he stuck with this uh number in the 40s um and didn't go down although there's also that's only one example so never oh sammy votnin another one Stayed with 45. Uh, why is Bonnie... Bonnie, why are you texting me Max Jones highlights? He's wearing 49 now. I'm confused. He was wearing 46 in last year's training camp, Jake. Oh, okay. Are you no, but, a fan of this team? But was he wearing... 40? He must have worn 49 in the OHL also is what Bonnie's saying, which is why he's going to continue to wear number 49. I believe that's probably what Bonnie's argument is, is that he's going to continue to wear that number. Okay, so even if he does... okay. That's actually a great question. I'm glad you asked that question. So even if even if he did continue wearing number 49, this jersey will still not be worn again. And so either way, you have a win-win. Let's say that the, he doesn't change his number. Then even then, you still have a jersey that was once in a season commemorated a very special event, 25 years of the Anaheim Ducks. Either way, it's a win-win. you got to go with it. Okay. Folks, okay. if you... Folks, if you're if you're thinking about what jersey to buy, 49 Jones I'm, is, is I, your your I'm, pick. Right I'm now. confused about what Bonnie's saying. I'm very very confused right now. Let's just go with that. Um, uh, by the way, oh Bonnie saying that he said he wants to wear number 49. So that's her point. Well, he wore 49 in junior, but could change. Yeah. So I do want to make mention there was a question earlier on uh, from a list asking about the Pod Classic game. It's going to be a week from today, next Sunday. Lakewood Ice, 12 yep. o'clock. Be there. Anyone who wants to come and just watch and make fun of us, you're more than welcome to. You're more than welcome to. So come and watch if you want to. And, yeah, it's going to be a really, really fun time. There were a couple of other questions that I'm trying to scroll back up to. Uh, Bob Shockey asked, why isn't this a drunk pot? It's literally St. Patrick's Day. Well, unfortunately, we have work tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what it boils down to. Yep. Um, Infinite Jester said, do you think the gold plan is a viable slash uh, good alternative to the current draft lottery system? The what a what a what The gold plan. I believe that the gold plan, Infinite Jester, correct me if I'm wrong. The gold plan is that it's however many points the team accumulates after they've been eliminated from playoff contention. And the team with the most points oh. accumulated gets the highest no, pick. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I mean, it's not an awful idea. 
<laughs> I'm only saying that because the Ducks are winning games right now. I, I agree. Um, Frostback said, if the Ducks don't land in a, a top five pick, do they make, move the pick plus player for a high caliber player? Huh? If the Ducks don't end up with a top five pick, do they move the pick? No. They keep the pick. They keep the pick. I agree. I agree. Sorry, uh, I, I, I'm getting into a basketball debate in the chat here. And that that's that's driving me up the wall. D frenzy. D frenzy is saying Kyrie Irving is better than Steph Curry. I mean, what if he is? He's not. That, what that's it, le, that's legitimately one of the most incorrect, dumb things I've ever heard. Sorry, Steph, D frenzy. S- Steph Curry is bad. <laughs> I can't help but laugh. Anyway, what, what, what else do we have to talk about? Um, Bonnie is so yeah. Bonnie's point was definitely the fact that he wants to continue where forty nine. I have no idea. The only reason why, um, uh, the only, re- also the Steph Curry take was a complete joke, by the way, people. Um, the I only reason so. why I think he may go down is that the Ducks have historically, uh, had players shift down once they became established on the team. But that is something that hasn't really kind of been, been a thing for the last couple of years. Uh, Ricard Raquel still has his number in the sixties. I think he was probably the first player that I can remember that didn't move numbers down once he, uh, once he became an established roster player. But I mean, you have Cam Fowler switching from 54 to four. You have Bobby Ryan, 54 to nine. You have Andre Kasha going, whatever his number was before. I can't remember it off the top of my head. I think it was 65 to 25. You have, uh, Brandon Montour going from what? 76 to 20, I've lost 26. Yeah. I've lost yes, track of Brandon. 71 Montour. to tw- 71, 71 to 26, to tw- 71 to 26. Um, and then Kasha 86 to 25, 86 to 25. There we go. Not 65. Um, you, 65? so I was crazy? thinking, I, I guess, I don't know. Crazy? I lost track already. Um, but so it, it's been a consistent thing. Uh, people are correcting me in the Twitch chat that it was 86 already. Sorry, people. Um, but, uh, it's been a consistent ducks thing of having a guy once he's established on the roster move down into a more uh, into a lower number. So I wouldn't put it past them wanting uh, 40 or wanting Max Jones to change from 49 down to a uh, <laughs> down to a lower number. Troy Terry is pretty much guaranteed to go from 61 to 19. Um, 19 is his number in his article. He said it was his number. So, yeah, Felix is really engaged in this uh, debate in our Twitch chat right now about the Celtics. He's very, 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 very flustered, very, very mad. Um, you have his warrior fandom coming out right now. He's uh, he's getting mad. D frenzy, good job, good job. Ugh. Um. So, uh, I don't know if we have any more questions. Felix, you want to start wrapping huh? this thing up? So, I guess while Felix is doing that, I'll make mention. For people out there that are patrons, please go and comment on the Patreon post about the watch party. By commenting on that, it gives me an idea of how many people are coming. Please put in there if you're going to come, and if you are, if you're going to bring a plus one with you. Um, Also, in that post, you can find where the watch party is going to be. This is a Patreon-exclusive watch party, so it is only for patrons uh, to come. It's going to be a really good time. I'm going to have a lot of fun. Uh, I'm excited for it. I'm really, really excited for it. And then... Also, if you do want to subscribe to the Patreon, you get at the $5 level, two bonus episodes a month. We are going to record, I believe, tomorrow one of the bonus episodes for this month. Uh, Topic is we are figuring out and will be determined. Um, If you have ideas and you are a patron uh, for one tomorrow that you want to see, please throw it into the channel on the Discord chat and you get access to the Discord chat if uh, if you are a patron, whether at the dollar tier or $5 tier. Right, and a question that we're getting in here from Lockdown Late Night, um, who do we take, you know, we being the Ducks, if we are one, three through five in the draft? One thing that I want to mention is that uh, we're going to do a bonus pod probably closer to the draft outlining all the prospects uh, outside. You know, we're going to do one through probably 15 uh, do you or want my something answer in that of, range. Do you want my answer of who I want? Well, you can say who you want, but I just want to mention that for the bonus pod, patreon.com slash pod. We're going to do a full podcast of all of the prospects. And so definitely be on the lookout for that because I think that's going to be a good one. Now, Jake, you said you had some picks. Go ahead and outline them. Uh, Dylan Cousins is the guy I want. 
Um, Is it cousins or cousins? I don't know. We keep going back and forth on this. I'm not going to find out until I actually watch somebody <laughs> mentioning his name. Lewis is saying winning boldly for Matthew Boldy. Please stop, Lewis. Lewis, that hurts me on the inside. That hurts me. Um, but uh, what was I going to say? Oh, there was another question from D Frenzy that said, would you trade two picks and a player for the top two pick? <sighs> Both picks for the... For a top two pick. Oh, Adam Hutchinson coming in with inside information in our Twitch chat. He said it's cousins. He lived I with tr- his best friend for a year. I trust Adam Hutchinson. I he trust is nothing. He's nothing but reliable. Adam's got an inside knowledge. No, but one, one thing I do want to mention, because I, I've actually talked about this a lot on the pod, is moving up in the draft. And I do think that it really depends where the Ducks fall. And so if it, let's say they fall to seven, eight, and they have the 21st pick as their, their second pick, I do think there is some merit to holding on to those picks. But if those two plus, let's say, a Ricard Raquel or something like that can get them into the top two, I think it's worth pulling the trigger. Because getting a Capo Caco, getting a Jack Hughes, I think that trumps the value that you're moving out. Obviously, you have to sell it to a team. You have to... Uh, get, you know, you have to get your owner to sign off. There's a lot of things that have to go through with that, but I do think that that would be worth doing because I think Hughes and Kako are that good. Uh, yeah, agreed. Uh, D Frenzy by the says, by the way, I love trolling Felix. Kyrie is not as good as Curry. By the way, folks, uh, this is just kind of an aside, but the number one way to get me upset and angry <laughs> is by making comments like that because. I am very protective of my warriors. Um, you shouldn't have yes. said that. You really shouldn't no, have said okay. that. No, it's okay. I, I want to give people more ways to interact with us, whether it's positive, <laughs> negative, whatever the case may be. It's okay. Uh, I'm here. All right. Want to land this plane? Let's land this plane. So all of this being said, thanks a lot for listening, guys. We do appreciate you tuning in. Once again, it's been a crazy season and it's even crazier that we only have eight games left together. We only have eight podcasts left together. We're going to make the most of those. We're going to find ways to make those fun. Um, as always, make sure to check us out. Patreon.com slash AC pod for $5 a month. You get two bonus episodes. You get access to the Patreon chat and we're going to have some good prospect content coming your way. We have some great writers in Anaheim calling who specialize in the prospect field and so we're going to get Shout, you shouts good, to John. Yes, we're going to get you some great prospect content. Um, as always, check out our YouTube channel. I shouldn't say as always because it's new, but make sure to check out our YouTube channel. Just search Anaheim Calling on YouTube uh, since a lot of people do like listening through YouTube to the pod. And of course, Apple Podcasts. Just search Anaheim Calling on there. Leave a rating and a review. We really do appreciate that. It helps grow the show and social media. Search up Jake. Follow him. Look at those LAFC tweets. Look at LAFC tying and not winning. It's a it's a great way to live. That's at Reindeer Games91 on Twitter. <laughs> I am people. on Twitter at Felix underscore Sicard. And of course, check out our homepage, Anaheimcalling.com at Anaheim Calling on Twitter. That is gonna do it for us tonight, guys. Oh, the last thing I should mention. If you're not yet a live listener, since a lot of our listeners listen, just like most podcast listeners do, recorded version the next day, that's fine. That's perfectly normal. But if you want some added, uh, you know, post-game responsiveness, just kind of getting that immediate reaction, I do recommend checking us out on Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash Anaheim Calling SBN. Just check us out once the game is over. Usually it's within 30 to 45 minutes after the game. You can live chat with us. You can just type in your question or something you want to say. We're going to respond to it. It's a lot of fun. As you can see, it drives the conversation. So all that being said, thanks a lot for listening tonight, guys. We really do appreciate it. And we will catch you at the next game, which I do believe is going to be Wednesday. Wednesday against the Winnipeg Jets. Gets, Gets off bobblehead night. The infamous Gensla at Bobblehead Night. So if you don't have tickets yet to that game, definitely go. And if you don't have tickets, check out the podcast after the game for the breakdown. We'll talk to you then. Bye.